Hi everyone, welcome to our second webcast in April. And just as a reminder, this entire year, we've really been updating you on standards resources. And so the two questions that we have been trying to address all year, what resources are available to Kentucky educators for implementing the Kentucky academic standards, and then how might schools and district utilize these tools in their implementation plans? And as part of our spring 2020 professional learning series, we've had webcasts on the first and third Thursday of each month. And then on the fourth Thursday of each month, we've been releasing a digital professional learning opportunity that's connected to whatever the topic is for that particular month. And then we also have our ongoing topic study on building a culture of learning. I'm really looking at the role of PLCs and that has actually wrapped up today and we have packaged that and made it available for you to either do on your own or to do with your school or district. Each month during the spring semester, we have been focusing on a different content area. So we're now in April and we've been looking at mathematics. So this is our second webcast. And then the next and the last webcast will be in May where we're gonna preview our summer, or summer professional learning opportunities. And so what you see on the screen is just a snippet of what the last webcast we did um, last April 9th, um, looking at just some resources for mathematics alignment. And then you can see as well a highlight of what that digital uh, professional learning is going to entail. But but our math consultants are here with us today. So Aaron Chavez and Maggie Doyle, and they're going to be walking us through a little bit of what that digital professional learning is going to be about. So I'm going to turn it over to them now. Thank you, Misty. So um, today we're going to dig a little deeper into the breaking down a standard resource. And the reason that we want to look specifically at this resource is because it is the perfect bridge between what we want educators to be getting from the CAS for Mathematics to what that's going to look like in the classroom. So we're going to look at how the components um, of the standards document can support teachers in designing standards salon instruction. And we're going to um, use that to experience how the changes in the Kentucky academic standards are going to be reflected in student experiences and what's happening in our classrooms around Kentucky. So everything that we look at today um, is going to be available on kystandards.org. So you're going to specifically want to go to the standards resources page, which is um, marked there for you. And the tools that we're going to dig into are the Kentucky Academic Standards, specifically looking at how we can use the breaking down a standard tool and the mathematics assignment review protocol to gain clarity on those Kentucky Academic Standards. And so just an overview or highlight of the um, breaking down a standard protocol is that it talks about um, it asks, what do we expect for our students to learn? And what's nice about breaking down the standards protocol is that it looks just like the standards document, but it has guiding questions. So if teachers or teacher teams or instructional leaders are struggling with the understanding of the depth of a standard, this resource takes you right through the steps to uh, gain better clarity of that particular standard. And so um, here's just a picture of what it looks like. Um, again, you can definitely tell that it looks like a standards page. It's just missing the content. And so it takes you um, got some guiding questions through each component of the architecture. And then what's really nice about that second page or the back of um, the breaking down a standard protocol is that it asks you some questions about where you want to go next or what are and this is where it, pl it plays a nice role for a PLC because it gets into um, curriculum or and also thinking about um, what coherence connections you might make um, whether it's within um, the same same cluster that you're going to make connections to um, with a standard or if it's a different domain um, or just any other notes or that your team is thinking about as you are planning to um, address the standard. And so um, the initial overview is that um, to use the CAS for mathematics is to identify what's the domain um, if you're K-8 or if 
your high school, it's conceptual category. And then what's that broader understanding of the standard? So right there in that cluster level, um, what does it take to get to that higher level thinking? So if it's three standards within a cluster, so we know that those three standards would have to be addressed before they could get to the students could get to that cluster level thinking. Great, Erin. And then um, those big ideas, that domain conceptual category, the cluster, um, are, are going to be things that you're going to want to keep in mind as you continue through the resource. So the next part of the resource focuses on the standard itself. So you want to start by identifying the target of the standard, and that's going to be is this standard conceptual understanding? Is it procedural skill or fluency? Is it application? And if your teachers are relatively new to working with the Kentucky Academic Standards for Mathematics, um, having that experience of getting to know those content standards will be really important. There is some information in the front matter um, that's listed on the tool itself so that you know exactly where to go to get support. So that's another benefit. Um, so each one of the standards should fall into one of those three categories. Now that's going to especially be true for elementary for those um, K-5 standards. However, one of the requirements of Senate Bill 1 um, 2017 was that there had to be fewer standards, but more clear. And so we wanted to make sure that we were clear about communicating those. Well, what that sometimes means, and especially for middle and high school teachers, you're going to notice that there are standards that have maybe part A, part B, part C underneath. So just know that there's some flexibility. So you may have a standard where part A is conceptual, part B is procedural, but it's these conversations around what should be happening that are going to be really powerful to have in the PLC setting. So when you're looking at conceptual understanding, we're just going to focus in on it just for a second um, and look at exactly what that means. So the description in the front matter of the standards document, conceptual understanding refers to understanding mathematical concepts, operations and relations. It's more than isolated or knowing isolated facts and methods. And um, students should be able to make sense of why a mathematical idea is important, the kinds of contexts in which it is useful, and it really allows our students to connect to prior knowledge. So as we have worked with teachers around the state, you know, they they really connect to this. So they're like, it's more than knowing facts and methods. You know, they can identify exactly um, why that's so important. And so conceptual understanding is really that foundation um, that all of our mathematical ideas are going to be built on. And the next type of target for our standards is procedural skill and fluency. Now there are some big misconceptions around fluency and Erin, feel free to jump in <laughs> um, anytime you want. But a lot of times fluency has um, that misconception that it's just getting it right and it's getting it right fast. But as you'll notice in the front matter of the standards document and in current research, um, it's not just those two things. It's about so much more. It's about being accurate, yes. And it's about being efficient, yes. But it's also about being flexible in your strategies. Um, and it's also about being able to choose an appropriate strategy. So um, that's a little different than um, I think traditional mindsets have seen and it's it's a little bit different than than how some of us were taught in school and so um, that nuance is really important. There's information in the front matter specifically about fluency, but we also want to point out that um, we also want our students to be able to solve more complex application and modeling tasks and we do understand that that's dependent upon procedural skill and fluency. So a lot of our um, our standards, we have conceptual understanding, we have procedural skill and fluency, and then our last section is on application. So they're really talking about how they're interwoven. I just want to add, Maggie, is that you're exactly right. Um, and even some grade levels will say, it'll um, say in a note, that the fluency part of that standard takes all year long. It's not just let me teach these couple of strategies in a couple of weeks and oh, I got it. No, it'll even say that this is a year long process for the students. So yeah, perfect. Erin, you've had me at Maggie, you're exactly right. You know, uh, you had me there, so perfect. Um, so our last type of target is application. And application is where our students get a valuable context for learning and they get the opportunity to solve problems that are relevant 
and meaningful. So it's through real world application that students learn, um, and this is really going to support that efficiency um, component in procedural skill and fluency because they're they're trying to figure out what is the most efficient method. They're determining whether their solution makes sense. They're reasoning and developing critical thinking skills. So as we look about our our targets, we have that that connection between having that basic understanding, that conceptual understanding of what's happening in our math content. We have an opportunity to build that procedural skill and fluency, and our students also get that opportunity to apply what they know in relevant situations. So that's what teachers are going to look at first, and then they're going to move on to clarifications. And so clarifications, um, this part of the protocol of breaking down a standard is really nice to dig into your standards to make sure that you're teaching those correct um, representations and strategies. Um, there's models, there's the area model, there's number lines. So the writers of the standards, um, when those teachers got together, they wanted to make sure that they gave some um, gave some sample models and strategies um, to be taught. And so that's powerful as well as possible misconceptions. Um, you know, if we can identify student misconceptions, then that makes us as a teacher better prepared for when we teach that content the next year. You know, we take a different approach. Um, and then also the coherence. And so um, there's three sections down there where it talks about, you know, where did the standard come from? What was the prior knowledge? Um, if my kiddos are having a hard time with this particular standard, well, maybe I need to go back and look at that pr uh, previous standard. Um, and then where is the standard going? So knowing that they understand to the depth of if that standard's conceptual understanding, then then they'll be able to be able to for that future learning to that it might be procedural and fluency or maybe it's to the application stage at the next um, grade level. And then also, how does it make connections? Are there um, standards that are in that cluster that need to be taught um, with one another or are there other connections in different domains? Um, we know that operations and algebraic thinking have a great connection to numbers in base 10 or in geometry or in measurement and data. So I'm um, just looking for those connections as well. Here's just an example of coherence. Um, and so when it's across grade levels, you will see that it's in linear format. So you see KY5MD2 is connected to KY6SP1. Um, and then that uh, future grade connection would be KY7SP1. So that's that linear, that across grade levels. But then if you look down at the bottom, um, then you can also see within a grade level. So you see that second grade standard of telling and writing time KY2 MD7. Well, there's another connection to number and base 10 standard. And then you can see the previous first grade standard and then the future third grade standard. So when they're stacked um, uh, up above one another or down below, then that means that it's within a grade level. So those connections are there. And as we talk about making connections, a lot of um, us traditionally have focused on our content standards and we have really lived in in that land of my mathematical content standard. And so with the Kentucky Academic Standards for Mathematics, your standards for mathematical practice, it's really important that um, all of our educators understand that these are standards. So um, they have to be things that are occurring into our classroom just as if as the standards for mathematical content are. The standards for mathematical practice are how students are going to engage in the mathematics. So if your um, district is getting ready to get to know the standards and go through that module, there's a full section in that getting to know um, the CAS for mathematics module that's that deals specifically with the standards for mathematical practice. And one of the first activities in there is to give teachers the opportunity to name those mathematical practices. And if your district and if your school and if your teachers recognize that that's an area for growth for them, 
please um, please utilize that module section to start um, and then and then reach out to us if you need more support there. Um, we are happy, happy to help educators as they're trying to grow and, and understand. Um, and Aaron's going to talk to you about one of the components that the, the standards writers um, intentionally built in to help support with the standards for mathematical practice. Just know that um, that these are elevated. So we've got our content standards and we've got these practice standards and they both have to be there for our students to be getting the opportunities to master their grade level content um, and to be getting those opportunities um, that they're going to have to have <laughs> to learn this mathematics. So they both have to be there. They are both critical and I'm going to hop down off my soapbox and turn it over to Erin to show you where to look in the document for that. Perfect, and so it's highlighted. Um, it's in green on your standards document and the title is called attending to the SMPs. And what's so nice about that is the writers of the standards, they took the content standards and the standards for mathematical practice and showed you what it looks like at a cluster level um, in every grade level. Um, and so if you're not sure, then that's a perfect place to start. It's not the end all be all, um, but it is, it's a definitely a way to see how those work and are connected um, and work in your classroom. And so um, if you wanna look more in depth on each individual MP that you can look into um, in the front matter on pages 12 through 15 for um, each MP. Um, and then also another great instructional resource that you could utilize is engaging the SMPs, the look fours and question stems. To, so it takes each mathematical practice and it tells you here are the teacher look fours, here are the student look fours, and then here's some possible questions or prompts. So if you're looking at a task um, and you think, man, well, I've really got to get MP4 or MP2. Well, then look at those questions and maybe you could rewrite that task to include those questions so that you get the kids engaged into those mathematics with the mathematical practices. Um, so great tool. Excellent, very true, Erin. And so as Erin just mentioned, the components within the CAST document are not the end all be all. So um, the second page of the breaking down a standard protocol, it specifically mentions across the top that that the coherence component listed and the clarifications and the attending to SMPs, those aren't an exhaustive list. And that's where this tool becomes really powerful in the PLC setting because you might be a first year teacher and you're trying to predict what misconceptions students might have around that content, but you need to talk to some of those veteran teachers who have taught that before, who have analyzed some student work and who can advise you on what that what that looks like. Or you might um, you might be at a school where all of you are getting some new professional learning on the mathematical practices. And so you you really want to talk about well, OK, we could do those things in the attending to SMPs, but what else could we do? What other practices could we engage in? How how else might our students experience this? Uh, there might be additional coherence connections within or across grade levels that you or your team notice. Um, so just know that in the components of the co of the standards document, those are really provided for guidance and we want teachers. We want PLCs to take those further. And this is also a great place, the second page of that planning tool, to include any notes that you or your team might in you might use internally. So um, as you're looking at your your program or all of the resources that you're going to use for your students, where do you feel like that fits in? Um, and so this is a great place to really talk talk more about specifically how your school, your classrooms, your teachers, your kids are going to experience learning around that standard. We also list that one of the next steps that you might want to consider is to um, use the assignment review protocol. So once you've given an assignment that you feel um, aligns to that standard, um, go back, look at it. Let's look at our breaking down tool. Did we cover everything we wanted to cover? Did we reach the full intent of the standard? And so these tools and these resources pair really nicely together. So for that reason, our professional learning library that we'll be releasing at the end of April is going to do just that. So those grade level samples for breaking down a standard are going to be paired 
with grade level samples for the assignment review protocol. So now that we've broken down, now that we really understand what this standard is asking really deeply, let's look at some of the learning experiences that we've been designing for students that that we've envisioned are giving students those opportunities and let's make sure that they do. So looking a little more deeply at the assignment review protocol, um, it's going to ask, does this task give your student the opportunity to meaningfully, meaningfully engage in worthwhile grade appropriate content? Because we know, um, and you all know, if you are watching that, if our students don't get access to grade appropriate content, they're never going to master grade appropriate content. And so our students can only do as well as the assignments that they are given. So we want to make sure that those assignments are aligned to the standards. They are grade appropriate so that we ensure that our students are getting those experiences. So the first section is going to talk about mathematical content. It's going to talk about the target, the coherence. Those are things that you just dug very deeply in in the breaking down the standard tool if you've already done that. Um, and it's also going to talk about cognitive complexity. There's a whole section that's going to deal with the mathematical practices. Again, remember five minutes ago my soapbox that I sat down off of, but just to um, reiterate those importances and make sure that we're using those question stems. So maybe I have this task. It's a great thing. My students are really engaged. How can I ask them questions that are going to promote the mathematical practices? Um, there's a section on relevance and one on student performance. So if you have student work to analyze, then th that would give you a great opportunity. So the one thing that is on that list that we hadn't really looked into today was cognitive complexity. But don't worry, in um, the tool we've embedded um, a resource and it's hyperlinked in there that will help you with that. So notice along the side, procedural, conceptual, application. So those same three targets that we've been talking about in the standards and then that's going to help you tell, OK, so this standard is conceptual. What level is this task at? What is it asking the students to do? So that matrix is there um, and you can be flexible with it, but it's there just to kind of give you some consistent rubric to kind of go back to and some consistent language. And not only that, but to give you some things to think about. So so maybe as my PLC is analyzing the task that we've given great we've dug into standards we've looked at it but we're noticing that everything is falling into that level one well what's the difference between level one and level two well maybe it's the procedural demand maybe for a conceptual it's whether or not they have to demonstrate um reasoning are they just recalling or are they having to reason so it's understanding those differences that can really see oh maybe we push our students to do this here and we give them that experience there so that's one of the components that we just hadn't covered yet in the breaking down tool, so we wanted to share that with you. Maggie, can I can also add really quickly um, back to the cognitive complexity slide that for K-5, um, you're not always going to have level three um, assignments that are that are right there just for the fact that um, they maybe haven't just covered enough mathematics to get to that level three. I'm not saying that there won't be some, but just don't worry if um, you think, man, all of my assignments, I've, that's the end goal. That's not true. That's not true for K-5. So just realize that, yes, you will have some um, tasks that get to the level three, um, but not all. OK, thanks. That's a great point, Erin. And that also just makes me think, um, as you use that tool, just have those professional discussions in your PLC, build that shared understanding. I know that when we did a sample of this somewhere, um, we had you know a rich debate over, well, I think it's level two and this group thinks it's level three and and we had you know different different opinions, but we got to talk about that and we got to come to a shared understanding. And the reality is, if we're debating over whether a task is level two or level three, that's an embarrassment of, <laughs> of riches right there. So that's that's the dream um, is just seeing, you know, that we were having those professional conversations and we have this framework to look at it and really build that understanding. Um, so we invite you at the end of that assignment review protocol just to just to consider if you were able to mark yes to everything great odds are we won't be able to mark yes to every question on every assignment and every learning experience that our students have 
and um, that's just the reality of nothing being perfect. So if it's not, then could minor revisions improve the alignment? Could another assignment fill the gaps that showed up when you looked at it? So I can give this task, but I'm also going to have to give this task to make sure that students get experience with both. Um, is the instruction balanced when considered collectively? So as we talked about before, um, one of the parts of the assignment review protocol is relevance. Well, in some cases, if your standard is conceptual, there might not be a whole lot of application in that. And so it's important to keep that in mind, but it's also important to know, OK, if this assignment isn't giving them the chance to to see the relevance in that, then where do they get that? Do they get that later on in my content and in my instruction? Did they get that later on in the next grade? Um, and just ensuring that all of those things are happening. So just a set of guiding questions to make sure that we know what we have. And um, if we aren't happy with that, where do we go from there? Thank you both. And it's such an awesome way to look at how our tools and resources really play together and work together to hopefully inform instruction in the classroom. So just five things to know before you go. As always, we highly recommend that you subscribe to kystandards.org if you have not already. Um, and just like they've been talking about throughout the um, webcast on April 23rd, the digital professional learning that's going to support what they've been talking about today will be released on KY standards where they're going to have grade level samples of looking at utilizing the breaking down a standard and an ass assignment review protocol for a standard at each grade level. Our next webcast, and it will be our last webcast for the 1920 school year, is going to be on May 7th. And we're going to just do a wrap up of some things in the spring, as well as give you a little bit of a summer preview of some professional learning opportunities. Also, we talked about in our last webcast coming soon, but it is now available on KY Standards, and that is our Kentucky Family Night uh, Math Resources. So just know that's available for you. And again, the last thing we would just like to remind you of, if you haven't already, please subscribe to the standards newsletter, because as we begin moving into the summer, that's really where you're going to get notifications of resources that we are releasing to really support standards implementation at the local level. So thank you for your time and joining us today.